This episode is brought to you by Tegas. Over the years of our partnership with Tegas, they have evolved from a pure expert network into a full company intelligence platform. I've been so impressed by the platform that my firm, Positive Sum, recently made an investment in Tegas. We did so because we feel that Tegas will be the gold standard platform for investing research for decades to come. Tegas streamlines the investment research process so you can get up to speed and find answers to critical questions on companies faster and more efficiently. The Tegas platform surfaces the hard-to-get qualitative insights, gives instant access to critical public financial data through BAM SEC, and helps you set up customized expert calls. It's all done on a single modern SaaS platform that offers 360-degree insight into any public or private company. As a listener, you can take Tegas for a free test drive by visiting tegas.co slash Patrick. This is Business Breakdowns. Business Breakdowns is a series of conversations with investors and operators diving deep into a single business. For each business, we explore its history, its business model, its competitive advantages, and what makes it tick. We believe every business has lessons and secrets that investors and operators can learn from, and we are here to bring them to you. To find more episodes of Breakdowns, check out joincolossus.com. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions. Hosts, podcast guests, their employers or affiliates may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. This is Jesse Puji, and today we're breaking down Netflix, the pioneer in entertainment streaming. Founded in 1997, Netflix has evolved over the years to become the leader in streaming entertainment with over 200 million subscribers globally. To break down Netflix, I'm joined by Ben Weiss, the Chief Investment Officer of Ethan Jackson. In this breakdown, we go into detail on Netflix, from their culture and tech advantages, to how content drives the business, and to how they will start generating substantial free cash flow in the future. Please enjoy this business breakdown of Netflix. All right, Ben Weiss, welcome to Business Breakdowns. Great to be here. For those who don't know, this is an all St. Louis episode, even though we're sitting in different places. And we're talking about a very exciting name, Netflix. You know, I assume most people listening know, but just for those who don't know, what is Netflix? And give us a brief view of their scale, size, any way you think about it in terms of where they are today. Netflix is an internet-delivered subscription entertainment service. So for a flat, fixed fee, subscribers get access to a broad catalog of movies and television shows. Customers can choose a pricing plan based on the number of streams and the quality of the picture. And the service is distributed all over the world. A helpful way to think about the scale of the business at this point There's the geographic scale, the financial scale, and the viewing scale. That's kind of how I frame it. So the business operates in 190 countries, producing content in 40 countries. It will end 2022 with about 227 million paid subscribers. At the end of the last quarter, there were about 73 million in the United States and Canada, 149 million outside the United States. And the business will have about $30 billion in revenue at the end of 2022. So it's a big global entertainment company operating all over the world, producing content all over the world. I've been a subscriber for as long as I can remember. So it's crazy to think about how much scale has come around it. Just to kind of baseline facts like the content, what portion of their content is their own versus other people's? And any headline figures around their subscribers to be on the regional Breakdown. Netflix began licensing content that was owned by other entertainment companies and studios. That's a common way that a lot of businesses in the entertainment start. HBO famously started licensing movies from other studios. So Netflix began with other people's product. And then in about 2013, they started making an aggressive investment in original content so they could produce their own shows and movies. So a helpful figure to communicate the scale of that. In 2018, the net book value of the produced content on Netflix balance sheet was about $6 billion out of $20 billion in content assets, so about 30%. Last quarter, Netflix had about $30 billion in content assets on the balance sheet. About $20 billion was produced content. So it's gone from 30% to 60%. So it's been a very large, steady build 
of original content in the business. For those who don't know, what's the founding story of Netflix? And maybe you can punctuate the specific periods because it's almost been like at least three companies in its history. It has a fascinating and dynamic corporate history, I think. The company was founded in 1997 by Reed Hastings and Mark Randolph. So Reed Hastings is most famously synonymous with the business. He previously founded a software company called Pure Software in the 90s, eventually sold it. So the company was founded in 1997 as a DVD by mail company. There'd be listeners that will remember for a flat fixed fee, you got access to a broad catalog of DVDs that were mailed to you. But the original vision of the business, as I see it, and that I think was Reed's plan was to eventually deliver entertainment over the internet. So they didn't name the company DVD by mail. They named it Netflix because they knew that's where the market was going. What's unique about Netflix is there've been really four big evolutions in the history of the company. It's rare for most businesses to undergo one and Netflix has gone four. So the first one was DVD to streaming. The company was founded as a DVD by mail company, as I said, and in 2007, they started streaming. The next big transition was going from a domestic business to an international business. So in 2010, Netflix entered its first international market, which was Canada. I think they realized early that entertainment over the internet was going to be a global business. So it was important to get global. That was the first step. And then in 2013, they, as I mentioned earlier, shifted from licensed content to producing their own content, most famously House of Cards. But actually, the first real Netflix original was a show called Lily Hammer from Norway. But 2013 was when they made the shift from licensing to producing their own content. Now we're very early in the fourth big shift in the business, which is moving from a pure subscription model to a subscription and ad-supported model. So it takes a certain type of management team and a special culture to be able to make four big business evolutions or pivots, and Netflix has done it successfully. That's exactly where my head went. I had this for later, but I think now is the right time, which is from an investor perspective, talk about the culture and the leadership. It sounds like that's the secret sauce that's allowed them to be as successful as they've been. So talk through that from your perspective. What makes it so special? What are the things that give you confidence in it in the future? Well, a lot has been written about the Netflix culture. Famously, they put out a culture deck that was one of the real seminal documents that came out of Silicon Valley. What's well known about the culture is a focus on attracting and keeping the best talent. So not the most people, but the best people. And they're willing to pay top of market to get those people. And then the business operates more, they've used the analogy like a professional sports team and not a family. So it's really a performance-oriented culture. What I've learned from studying the culture is culture cannot be copied. Products can be copied. User interface can be copied. A process can be copied. A culture cannot be copied. Values and principles can't. And Netflix is organizing values and principles, I think, have always been to put the member first. So focusing on member needs and working backwards from what your customer once that allowed them to anticipate a lot of the shifts that have happened in the market. And then a willingness to be bold and go all in when the opportunity is big. So that's another attribute that I think maybe is a little underappreciated, but they didn't dabble going international. They went fully international in 2016. As I referenced earlier, have made very large investments in original content because they saw that as key to the future of the business. So when the opportunity was big and it made strategic sense, they really committed and put all of their resources behind it. I think those are two defining traits of the culture that have led to the success. And when you think about Reed and sort of him as a leader, are there one or two examples of particularly courageous decisions that have gotten all the way to the public's eye or other things like that that you think of or you quote when you think about the business? Well, I think Reed... And his examples probably been internalized in the business has been just so resilient as a CEO. So there have been a few real challenging periods in the history of the company. Famously, when they split the DVD and the streaming business, that was not the best episode. But he has always managed through that. And I think the organization, following partly in his example, has really developed a resiliency that has allowed them to navigate constantly changing market in an extremely competitive entertainment market. That has been really key to their success. And I also think Reed has always preached focus. So it is a big advantage in a business, particularly I think in a new category that's forming to have a highly focused business model and to stay keyed in on the drivers of the business that are going to matter. And Reed has always set that example. 
It's really been improving the content, improving the product, and improving the marketing. Those have been three key drivers of the business. And Reed has always kept the business focused on those core drivers. One last thing before we start to go deep into their business. Can you talk a little bit about the streaming market? It's obviously evolved quite significantly over the last decade or so. Maybe just kind of two points in time. Where was it 10-ish years ago? And then where is it today? And how do you think that's kind of changed the game for Netflix? Or how does that impact Netflix? 10 years ago, it was still really, I wouldn't say in its infancy, but it was very early. So some metrics that will help you kind of frame how big and developed the streaming market is today. Just in the US, streaming was about 37% of total television viewing time in September. So it's just starting to overtake broadcast and cable as the predominant form of entertainment for television. Interestingly, broadcast and cable combined are still a bigger share of viewing than streaming. So that, to me, suggests that we're actually still early in the shift of consumer time to streaming because I think streaming provides a better experience for most customers. It's on demand. It's personalized. We'll get into some of that. But eventually, most television viewing and most entertainment will come over the internet and will be streamed. So that 36 or 7% share in the fullness of time will probably be close to 100. So it's still early, which is if you're a bull on Netflix, cause for optimism. If you're Netflix, how do you think about competing in this market? And as an investor, how do you think about how they compete? One of the big bear arguments on Netflix has been competition. So for a long time, Netflix was kind of the only game in town on streaming. And now you have very large, well-capitalized legacy media companies, Disney, Warner, Discovery, Paramount+, Plus, Comcast with Peacock have entered the market. Those companies have large libraries of intellectual property. They have a lot of experience developing great content. You also have mega cap tech companies, Amazon and Apple, who have made increasingly large investments in entertainment. They don't monetize entertainment directly in the same way as some of the legacy streaming companies. It's more either in Apple's case, probably to deepen engagement in their ecosystem and build their brand, and in Amazon's case, to make Prime stickier. But you have a competitive market. The way I have always thought about it is most consumer markets are not zero sum. It's not usually winner take all. If you think about soft drinks or apparel or fast food, there's room for multiple players if you're able to differentiate your product and offer value to your customer. So it's unlikely that it will be a winner take all market. And then entertainment's unique because people have such broad tastes that if you have exclusive original content that customers value, your service is not likely to be a direct substitute for another service. So if Netflix has shows and movies that you love that you want to watch, you will not see Disney or Paramount Plus as a direct substitute for the service. That creates slightly different dynamic in the market than you see in a lot of other consumer markets. Of course, they are competing for consumer time and consumer money. So you do need to have a really great service that keeps customers engaged and keeps them paying that monthly fee. But there's room for multiple companies to do well if they deliver great content and have a wonderful product experience. Does Netflix and do you as an investor think of it like a pecking order for these services? Is that a good way to think about it? Where it's like, if I lose my job tomorrow, I might cancel these five. This one I'm never going to let go of. Is that the right way to think about it? I think that the hope if you're in a Netflix investor is that if consumers are going to choose one service, they're going to choose Netflix. And the reason I'm optimistic that they would is, to my knowledge, no competing service offers as broad and diverse of a content catalog that can meet the taste of every person in the house. So there's people that love rom-coms. There's people that love documentaries. There's people that love stand-up comedy. Netflix really offers a full menu of content, and that's key to being the one essential service that the household's going to keep. There's a few other reasons I think Netflix becomes the one service you have to have. The performance of the actual app, I think, is superior to any competitor. That's probably underappreciated as a advantage, but entertainment time is scarce, and consumers want the app to work every time consistently with no buffering. And Netflix, given that they've been streaming for 15 years, has really developed the service that works, I think, better, more consistently than any competitor. So I always think about it this way. If you ask 10 people which service is the best content, you're going to get several different answers depending on the circle you run in or depending on what people may be watching that week. But if you ask 10 people which app is the best performing app, which works the most reliable, the least amount of buffering, I think 9 out of 10 say Netflix. 
that consistency, that guaranteed high quality performance, which they've made a lot of investments to deliver, makes it more likely that Netflix is going to be the one service that people will keep if they have to pick one. It's almost so good that you don't even realize. And now that you're saying it, I think about like the volume wasn't working on Disney Plus on Saturday. I'm remembering instances, but I cannot even recall an instance where it didn't work on Netflix. Yeah, it's hard to make a product intuitive, easy to use and seamless. I think a lot of work goes into the back end to do that. And so you're not fully conscious of that every time. But what it does is it drives repeat usage, it drives loyalty. And it's the service that if you're looking for something on a Friday night, you don't have to watch, you're going to choose Netflix. So let's jump into the p and I want you first kind of just walk us through it at a high level. And then I want to go back through each major item and talk about the business through the lens of that item on the p and So walk us through starting with revenue down to EBITDA or cash flow, and then we'll pick off starting at the top each one of those. As I mentioned earlier, in 2022, Netflix will generate about $30 billion in revenue. The average revenue per subscriber, so what the average member pays per month, is about $11.85. That varies pretty broadly depending on the geographic region. So in the United States and Canada, that's $16.37 a month. In Asia Pacific, it's about $8.34 a month. So you have different levels of ARPU is the term, depending on the region, but about $30 billion in consolidated revenue. And then four main categories of costs in the P&L. The first big one is cost of revenue, which is mainly content amortization. So think about the content that Netflix produces and then the expense of that content on the P&L. That this year will be about $18 billion. It's about 60% of revenue. And then three categories of operating costs, marketing costs, which will be about $2 billion, 6.6% of revenue, technology and development, which will be $2.6 billion, 8.6% of revenue, and then G&A, which will be about 5% of revenue. So if you add up the operating costs, marketing, technology and development, G&A, it'll be about 20% revenue. So you end up with $30 billion of revenue, less $18 billion of cost for content, and about $6 billion of operating costs, you get to an EBIT margin of about 20%. That's about where I think Netflix will come in this year. And does all that EBIT turn into cash flow? No, and that's probably worth its own discussion. But this year, Netflix will generate about $1 billion in free cash flow. So $6 billion of EBIT, $1 billion of free cash flow. The delta there between EBIT and free cash flow is really the addition to content assets that shows up on the cash flow statement. So Netflix is continuing to invest up front in original content and produce their own content, which causes a bit of a drag on cash relative to operating profit. So revenue, you mentioned obviously the US versus APAC. How do you think about, I guess, unit economics and all the pieces that go into that? Particularly churn, I want to double click on. Yeah, it's hard to get a clean read on churn because the business operates in so many different markets at different states of maturity. The the numbers that I've seen from reputable sources are that it churns about two and a half, two point six percent, which is lower than any competitor. As with any subscription business, I mean the real objective of the business is to maximize the lifetime value of the customer. One way to do that is to make sure the customer stays engaged and doesn't churn or quit. So Netflix, by all appearances, has the lowest churn in the industry. The way that I think about the unit economics really is, can Netflix continue to drive revenue higher per member at a relatively fixed cost of content that does not scale proportionally to revenue? So the real opportunity in the business going forward to drive operating profit and free cash flow is to continue to grow your revenue and to keep your content cost, your cash content cost relatively fixed. So it's almost like a theme park. Can they build it and then can they just get more people through it and or charge more per person that walks in the door? Absolutely. And the build of original content over the last several years should position the company to do that. You know, it takes 10 years to really get good at anything. So Netflix has now been producing their own content for about 10 years. Their competitors, by the way, have been doing it for 50 to 100 years. So they had a bit of a head start, but I think they've gotten much better at figuring out which titles members want to watch, which categories of content they need to create a full slate that keeps people engaged how much they need to spend per piece of content to really make that content the best expression of whatever it is. So they've gotten much more efficient at how they spend money. That should hopefully be a real source of operating leverage going forward. The company actually said on their last call that the level of content spend where they are now about 17 to 18 billion 
is the right zip code for the next few years. So they're at a place now where they feel like that number is going to support a substantial amount of viewing without needing to grow much more. Just to give you a frame of reference, in 2017, operating profit of the business, the margin was about 7.7%. They did about $11.6 billion in revenue and 800 and I think $80 million in operating profit. This year, as I said, so they'll do about $30 billion in revenue and about a 20% operating profit margin. So they're getting a lot of operating leverage in the business. And when you think about pricing power, I mean, how do you evaluate how much pricing power they have? Well, they've been able to raise their global ARPU from $9.43 in 2017 to, as I said, about $11.85 in the last quarter. So you've seen about a 25% increase in ARPU. That's also a little distorted because currency has been a big hit to the P&L this year, just in the stronger dollar. But they've been able to raise price over time by consistently making the product experience better and making the content better. So as I said earlier, I don't think entertainment is substitution market. People don't take the lowest bid on content. They don't just watch any show that's on. They want to watch the content that they care about and they want the experience to be great. So by investing in those areas, Netflix has been able to raise price over time. And as long as they're able to continue to deliver content that people value and make that experience better, I would expect their pricing power to be sustainable. They are offering which we can talk about an ad supported tier. That was next on my list. So what will that do to their ARPU and how do you think about it? Or how do you model it in? It's hard to model because it's early. What we know about the ad supported tier is it will be about $6.99 per month in the US with ads. So you'll get about four to five minutes of ads per hour. So a lower price point, a light ad load. They're launching the ad supported tier in 12 markets around the world. Those 12 markets are about 75% of the total brand advertising market in the world. So big opportunity in advertising. What the hope is and what Netflix has communicated is that the ad tier should be ARPU neutral to slightly beneficial. When you account for the $6.99 per month that customers will pay, plus the advertising dollars that they'll be able to generate from the ad tier, there should be no dilution in ARPU over time from offering an ad supported tier. It seems less like an ARPU move, right? And more like a, this is a way they can get subs that are otherwise maybe couldn't afford or wouldn't spend the money on it. Absolutely. It should expand access to the product over time to customers that might be a little more cost sensitive and that are willing to tolerate advertising for a lower price point. I guess in your model where you're like, okay, I invest in content once, then like, sure, I want to get more pricing powers, I can raise rise, but I also want to get everybody on the service because it doesn't cost me anything incrementally. This seems like a smart move. You said 73 million people in the US. That's probably the most mature market they have. So how much headroom is there in the US for incremental subs? What's interesting is two figures that I think would suggest there's a lot of room for growth in the US still. So the pay television market in the US, just linear cable, topped out at about 100 million paying homes. So Netflix right now has, as I said, between the US and Canada, about 73 million. And then there are 30 million homes in the US and Canada that are sharing passwords. So they're using someone else's credentials to log in without paying. So right now, Netflix in the US and Canada between the paid customers and then the customers they're sharing passwords is about 100 million. They're just not monetizing 100 million given the password sharing. So I think the challenge for them is less about do they have a product that everybody wants that the you know, 100 million homes plus are going to pay for and more can they convert 30 million households that are not paying for the service into paying customers? The advertising tier is one way to do that. It offers a lower price on ramp to the service and then figuring out the right way to go to market with figuring out how to get people to convert to paying customers is another and they're working on that now. But the takeaway is there's a very big market in the United States and Canada for the service. I don't think it's anywhere fully penetrated in terms of monetization. Yeah. The password sharing, I mean, my brother uses mine. You know, we can both afford Netflix, obviously. But, you know, it's just like I set it up on his house one time and he just used it. It's like laziness, right? It's like just like he hasn't needed to. But if it just logged him out and said, hey, you know, you're in LA and this account owner is in St. Louis, like we're pretty sure this is not yours. He'd probably sign up for it in a second. I always say on the spectrum of problems, this is a pretty good one. 
It's actually the full number is about 100 million plus households around the world are using someone else's account and not paying. So on the spectrum problems, it's a good problem, but it is still a problem because there's a lot of viewing that's not being monetized. So they need to figure out how to convert those, as I said, into paying customers, but a really good opportunity. And you would be encouraged by the fact that you have people already watching Netflix in the ecosystem. They're finding value from the content. So the challenge is just getting them to pay. On the advertising tier, they have, as I said, about 8% of the viewing, depending on the month in the US, and they have none of the advertising money. So that eventually over time is going to shift. The US advertising, pay television advertising market's valued at about $65 billion, So it's a big pool. So Netflix having 8% of the viewing, none of the advertising money, and now developing this ad-supported product should be a driver of revenue and profit over the next several years. Any other big revenue drivers or opportunities? I'm always curious, why don't they syndicate their shows or show them in the movie theater? Do they play around with any of that stuff? Is that an opportunity for them or does that not fit their model? It could in the future. To date, the strategy has been to keep their content exclusive to Netflix. So consumers, if they want to watch Stranger Things or Bridgerton or Squid Game, they have to sign up. And so you don't want to confuse people, especially early in the development of the market and make the content available in other places. You want to keep everything exclusive to Netflix. There is real licensing money that they're not going after today in terms of licensing their programming because more people than not have not seen Netflix shows. So there's networks and distributors around the world that would probably pay a nice amount of licensing fee to access that content, which would mostly be high margin revenue because they've already paid for the content. So it's potentially an opportunity, but I think for the foreseeable future, keeping most of the content exclusive to Netflix is going to be the strategy. The other two areas of potential revenue growth. One we touched on was advertising. And then the other is businesses that can be built on the intellectual property that Netflix owns. So think consumer products, theme parks, games, which are not likely to be huge revenue streams, but they're very high margin revenue streams because you've already paid for the content and you're just licensing the rights to sell shirts or sell games or develop a theme park ride based on your intellectual property. So over time, I think that will be another big opportunity for them, particularly to grow the profits of the company. Maybe there's a case study here just to show how resilient the business is. Disney Plus launched, I think, in 2019. And it went and got 100 million subscribers in short order, from what I understand. Was there any impact on Netflix's business vis-a-vis churn? Was there any noticeable impact in terms of how people churned or competitive dynamics there? None that I'm aware of. Both services have been able, up until fairly recently, to grow their subscriber base, both domestically and internationally, a pretty steady clip. So it doesn't appear in the numbers that the services are being viewed as substitutes or that Netflix customers were churning off Netflix to sign up for Disney+. Plus. They've both done well. That Disney Plus subscriber number is just worth noting is a little bit, it's not inflated, but it was definitely benefited by their hot star business in India, where they immediately had access to a very large base of low ARPU, but a lot of subscribers in India. They didn't scale to 100 million overnight. They had a big base that they were coming to. But no, I think both services have been able to coexist and do very well together. And they've probably been more complementary than anything else. So let's talk about the cost of sales revenue. You said 18 billion towards content amortization. How do they spend that money and how do they spend it effectively? Walk us through sort of how you get excited about that bet and I guess the level of it as well as sort of the allocation of it. The budget can be a big source of competitive advantage because embedded in that 18 billion is spending for different categories of content as a reference earlier that people value and like. So you have original television shows, you have increasingly an original film slate, you have animated kids content, you have content that's being produced all over the world. So they're making an investment in entertainment um, at the high end at a scale that really no other company is able to do. And so that budget, when you're able to outspend your competitors, deliver more new, diverse, high-value entertainment to your members is a source of sustainable competitive advantage. So as an investor, you like to see that. It's a barrier to entry and it makes the business defensible. You want to balance that against a number that allows the business to be profitable and to generate free cash flow. As I mentioned earlier, about 20% EBIT margins this year, a billion in free cash flow. 
The hope is you are able to have a level of scale in your content investment that, as I said, creates a barrier to entry, makes it hard for people to compete, but also allows you to be very profitable. I think we're getting close to that inflection point really now. You know, as an investor, just the way that I've kind of modeled it is if they're able to grow their revenue at 10% annualized through 2025, they'd have a business at about $40 billion in revenue. If they're able to keep their cash content spend at about 17 to $18 billion, that should allow them to reduce cost of revenue from about 60% to 50%. So you'd have about $20 billion in gross profit. And if you're able to keep your operating costs, those three categories of costs that I mentioned earlier at about 20%, of sales, you could end up with an operating profit number of about $12 billion, which should approximate free cash flow as content amortization and cash spend converge. You'd end up with a fully taxed profit number of about $10 billion, and you could generate potentially $20 per share earnings. I would not presume to tell what multiple investors should put on that, but I would put maybe a 25 times multiple on that for the globally dominant software-based entertainment company with very predictable recurring revenue high margin profits and a growing library of proprietary intellectual property and consumer entertainment preference data. So I think that could be, you know, $500 stock versus maybe 280 today. So that is just illustrative of the potential earnings growth in the business if you're able to keep that cash content number relatively fixed at around 17 billion, which Netflix said they should be able to do. On the content front, can you give everyone a sense of what is like Disney's kind of a weird one, I suppose. Hulu, like what are the other comps? What are they spending on content per year? You know, it really varies. Some of them break it out, but it's not necessarily easy to get a clean number given that a lot of, at least the legacy media companies have a large percentage of their budget allocated to the linear model where they're spending on sports and news and their cable channels. I don't have necessarily a great number on what other companies are spending. I mean, I'm just curious, is it like the same amount? Is it two times, three times? Because to your point, I think it is a huge barrier. One other question on the content front, if you know the answer is, the benefits of owning versus licensing seem pretty obvious, I think, but maybe you can state what they are. My question for you about that is, what is the cost differential? Or if you were to case study, I don't know, House of Cards versus licensing CSI or something like, I'm trying to understand a little bit more about how does that work economically for the business different? Well, I'll start with the benefits of original content. I touched on some of it earlier, but there's a few key benefits. One, you get creative control over the content. So if you know what your members watch and love, and Netflix probably has more granular data into consumer entertainment preference, what people are actually watching, what they're binging, what they rewatch than any company, at least in the premium space in the world, there's a big benefit to saying, let's make more of what our members love and let's take creative control over the production of content. And the other is obviously global rights. So you want to have rights to content all over the world so you can create a consistent consumer experience and you can get more impact on your marketing when you have the same content available to every member all over the world at the same time. Another reason was to build local production. I think early on, Netflix realized the entertainment market was going to be fully global once it moved to the internet and they wanted to build out local production around the world. That infrastructure really wasn't there. So moving to an original content allowed Netflix to create high production value entertainment in markets everywhere in the world. And that's been a big source of a competitive advantage. And as we mentioned, another benefit is owning and controlling the underlying intellectual property. In terms of the economics of producing versus licensing, there are several different components that are, I think, important for investors to think about. One is producing your own content is cash intensive upfront. So you do have to lay out the capital upfront versus licensing where you don't have to do that as much. It's much more time of the window in which you're going to access the content and you're obviously not producing a movie or show two years in advance. You're not funding development pre-production. So it's less capital intensive up front, but you don't own the intellectual property over time and you don't have full control over the rights. How to think about the individual cost of a piece of content, you want to think about it relative to the viewing that it can generate. I think Netflix calls it the efficiency ratio. It's not so much how much you spend on any individual piece of content, 100 million, 200 million. It's really what type of viewing can you generate on that spend? And then secondarily, what kind of brand halo and just cultural heat can you generate around the title? In customer acquisition. In customer acquisition, exactly. That makes sense. Is that You have to actually evaluate. It's almost like a baseball player. It's not just on base percentage, but slugging percentage. And there's a bunch of other things for every given piece of content. Is there a margin differential? 
I don't know that there's a one size fits all answer to that question. Some of the variables that you would want to think about when you license it from a studio, you pay a studio markup. So the studio has overhead. They want to make a margin on their cost. So Netflix is paying effectively for that studio markup. And when you produce your own content, you take that cost out. So if you go directly to work with the creative talent, you produce it yourself, you're not having to pay a margin to the studio. Ultimately, I think with a subscription model, what you're really worried about is just the viewing you generate per piece of content. So you're not making a direct margin on the $100 million movie you produced or the $50 million television show. Like certainly in the box office, it's much easier to say, here's what you paid for the movie. Here's the movie cost. Here's what the movie generated in box office. Here's the return on that capital. A little harder in a subscription model because everything's bundled together. But you take costs out when you produce your own original content. But over time, probably it's not a source of savings because Netflix is going to make sure the production value is very high quality and they're going to really put money into the uh, entertainment that they fund themselves. I'm thinking out loud and it's probably viewing, like you said, customer acquisition, churn reduction. They probably have all these signals they look at to know how content has shifted their business in meaningful ways. Yes. One of the reasons on top of just the other benefits we talked about is you can acquire customers and keep customers if you have content that they care about that's exclusive to your service. This is a good segue into marketing. But I remember anecdotally hearing back in the days of House of Cards, Netflix has always been one of the smartest direct response marketers on the planet. And then they launched House of Cards and they're like, this thing lowered our CPA lower than the best ad we've ever run in the history of the company. And that's when it seemed like they started to realize there's a different way to do marketing in their business. It was an incredibly effective marketing tool to take original content that you already own, you control, and then use that as a tool to acquire customers. It's really a phenomenal model. So you said they spent about $2 billion in marketing. Anything noteworthy to discuss there? I mean, I know it seems to have transitioned to more of a content brand model versus a DR model, I know, 10 years ago. But anything else there that you think is worth hitting on? The only development that I think is noteworthy it's not a material one, is they're spending a little more money on big temple movies to market those movies off of Netflix. So The Gray Man was this year, which was a big blockbuster film, and they want to build awareness for that movie and drive audience. And so just in the same way that a, a studio might spend a lot of money to make sure people show up on Friday night, Netflix is spending a little bit more money to build awareness of its original film brands and try to grow the audience. But otherwise, no, in terms of the amount that Netflix spends on marketing per hour of original content that they release remains incredibly efficient. And most of the marketing is done on platform through high quality personalization. So they really figured out how to turn what has been historically a variable expense, definitely in the film business, but in entertainment into a fixed expense by just marketing directly to you as a consumer once you log into the app based on what your content preferences and your viewing history has been. Is that marketing number trended down over time in aggregate? And do you look at CAC at all as an investor? And if so, how has that trended over time? The marketing has roughly stayed stable as a percentage of revenue. So no, the absolute number has gone up, but I think about it as a percentage of revenue. CAC has, again, been a little tougher to get a clean read on given that the business operates in four different geographic regions and is in different stages of maturity around the world. And then let's talk about R&D and tech. You started talking about this earlier. They spend $2.6 billion, as you said. It seems like a huge advantage. I mean, the app, as we talked about, it works flawlessly so well that you never even know. I was talking about this Disney Plus example on Saturday. I was putting Home Alone on for my kids and the audio wasn't working. And I gave it two or three chances. And we literally were like, okay, let's watch something on Netflix instead. It's kind of a funny example. But what are some of the other technology advantages that are probably less spoken of that you think make a big difference to the business? I'll give you a few that I think are maybe underappreciated. And they're really a result of focus. Netflix, sort of, it's amazing, but they're still, to my knowledge, the only global pure play streaming company where the business is just totally focused on delivering a great streaming experience. All the competitors they mentioned either have legacy businesses or entertainment is sort of an encore to their business. So Netflix is completely focused on streaming. And I think the practical tangible business benefits of that have been a better streaming experience. So four areas just to call out in terms of investment that I think drive that superior experience. One is they were one of the first consumer internet companies to move to the public cloud. So they moved all of their infrastructure and compute to AWS. That migration took about seven years and it was painful. 
But the result is I think Netflix is now one of the leading cloud-based software services in the world. And as the needs in terms of the recommendations and the personalization becomes more compute intensive and complicated over time, that shift to the cloud really positions them well to continue to deliver great experience there. Another big investment that they've made in technology is their content delivery network, which is called Open Connect. Netflix built and operates a proprietary a CDN like in Akamai, which helps the ISPs around the world, the internet service providers, localize and manage Netflix traffic to deliver the best, most cost-effective streaming experience for all the members. So there's about 17,000 servers deployed in 158 countries in the Open Connect. That is a key infrastructure asset, and it is one of the reasons the streaming experience is better. This is all in the area of, of R&D and tech and development. This is all in this line out of expense. They built a software tool called Branch Manager, which allows for interactive entertainment experiences. I don't know if you've done this with your kids, but there's a growing library of interactive content where you kind of choose your outcome or choose which way you want the story to go. And that's really sophisticated technology behind that. It took it about two years to build. The first big release was Bandersnatch in 2018, which was a Black Mirror movie. But they're really growing that business. You know, you can imagine a future where you, in a romantic comedy, you may pick who the lead chooses to go with, or in a horror movie, which alley does the lead character go down. So that interactive technology is creating more engaging entertainment experiences. They built that internally. And then the last one, which may seem sort of prosaic, but it's really important, is the investments they've made in language and translation. So to make content more accessible to people around the world, you want to make it available to them in their native language. So Netflix has made big investments in subtitling and dubbing. They subtitle, I believe, now in 37 languages and they dub in 34 languages. And that just drives more leverage per fixed piece of content. So once you spend $20 million or $30 million on a movie, in order to drive or show the most viewing, you want to make sure people can access it in their preferred language. So it's very complicated, very hard to do, and they've done a lot of work there. And I think they're by far the global leader in the quality of the subtitling and dubbing and how easy it is to access the subtitling and dubbing on the service. In fact, in 2021, 97% of the subscribers watched a non-English language title, which is a pretty remarkable statistic when you think about it, because that was probably not in anybody's model You know, 10 years ago that you'd have US consumers watching foreign language shows. And a big part of that is the subtitling and the dubbing is so good. And it really is. We are Squid Games and then Money Heist, You know these two shows. And our all pair is from Brazil and she watches them in Portuguese and we talk about them. And it's like crazy because it's so good that it's like the same show and even the voices are optimized appropriately. It's interesting because I actually think the consumer behavior is sort of changing where even if you're watching it in your own language, you want subtitles. So you don't miss anything. Native English speakers are watching shows in English subtitles just so they can catch all the dialogue. And Netflix has really pioneered that. But the broader point is you always hear content is king. And I think really experience is content. It's like a restaurant is not just about the food. The restaurant is about the hospitality and what's the ambiance like and how's the service. And so all of these different investments that Netflix has made, which we've talked about, drive a superior experience. It makes the app easy to navigate. It makes it work every time. The interface refreshes more. The merchandising is vivid and clear. And that's not an accident. That's a result of the investment that they made in the backend technology to deliver that great experience. Yeah, I think it's easy to forget now because of how content-oriented they are. It's viewed as an internet tech company based in Silicon Valley. And I think what you're highlighting is how big that advantage is. It is. And there's about 11,000 employees at the company. And my best estimate is half of them are working on the technology side of the business. So you really have this unique marriage of entertainment and technology, which no company that I'm aware of in the past has done both so well. So you've had companies that have done technology wonderfully, but not been great in entertainment and vice versa. But now you have one that does both. I think that's part of the magic of the business is to be able to make those two have this harmonious kind of union between the two that ends up delivering this magic experience for customers. I mean, one thing that I understand about the business, Reed very specifically moved to a co-CEO structure Reed's first company was like, I think, a QA software business. <laughs> so he literally started a, a software company and the other co-CEO is a hardcore content guy. It's a great point. If you think that businesses are sort of made in the images of the founders, which is true often, you have Reed, who we talked about, who's this technologist, Stanford trained computer scientist, founded a software company. I think that's really his 
domain. And then you have Ted Sarandos, who's the co-CEO who used to be the chief content officer who had a very different background than Reed, but he grew up as a child loving television and he became sort of an encyclopedic about entertainment and the history of entertainment. He managed a chain of video rental stores in Arizona. And that experience actually gave him two really key insights into the business. One is how much people value a great recommendation because, you know, you go to your person working at the store, what movie should I watch? And then he also got to watch a lot of movies. I think he's got really good taste. So Ted has been responsible, I think, for developing and building the entertainment side of the company. And now he's staffed it with amazing talent. Belle Bajari runs Global TV. She's wonderful. Scott Stuber does original film. And then you have on the tech side, it's been really driving it. Now you have a great team behind him. Greg Peters, who's the CEO, who's really the architect of the advertising business. So you have all stars across the board in entertainment and in technology. That's definitely one of the advantages. Is there anything else that, you know, in terms of this deep dive that we didn't touch on or cover that you think is noteworthy in the story? I think as an investor, you want to invest in companies where the product or service is durable. It's just worth remembering that the first movie studio, I believe, was formed in 1912, was Universal. And then the first television station started broadcasting in 1928. So movies and TV as forms of entertainment have been extremely durable over time. Obviously, the technology mediums that deliver the movies and TV have changed. The storytelling sensibilities have changed. But in terms of a product that consumers really value and love, entertainment in the form of movies and TV has really been pervasive in our culture for a very long time. So this is a extremely, in my view, durable end market. And Netflix's challenge is obviously to make the technology as good as it can be to give consumers the best experience today but they sell something that people have really valued and wanted for a long time. The escape, the relaxation, just lean back, frictionless experience that entertainment, the movies and TV offer, there's nothing really like it. So as we start to look forward, you know, you sort of outlined this case for the business where its revenue gets to 40 billion, its gross profit is about 20 billion, and the rest of these teams of marketing, R&D, sort of stay proportionate. And that yields 10 billion in EBITDA margin, all of which becomes free cash flow, or most of which because you're not investing ahead in content. So what you're amortizing is what you're reinvesting, almost like a factory or any kind of capital intense business that's pretty defensible. So let's say that you and I talk in five years, which I'm sure we will, and we go, man, they totally blew through this. They're doing 15 or 20. I mean, they're crushing it. What are the couple things that they got right? What happened? They were able to grow the advertising tier faster and in a greater scale than maybe analysts or the market expects. I think this may be more the case outside of the US, but if there's a really big market for a lower priced Netflix with advertising, and then the advertising experience is just really good, it's highly targeted, it's very addressable, the measurement's good, so the monetization of the advertising is good. You know, I think the revenue can be higher than what I estimated. I estimated 10% annualized revenue growth, and that's about what they're doing now on a currency basis. I think that could be conservative. But one key upside driver would be advertising growth. Another would be figuring out password sharing. So as I said, there was 100 million plus households that are sharing passwords. If they're able to develop a model that converts, allows password shares and paying customers, you could have upside to the subscriber number and then to the revenue number. Is there any version of this in the upside where they crack a new category of content? Sports is a funny example where at some point sports must have been a huge driver. Like, is there some other esports where they get it and all of a sudden the business grows faster and bigger than you can imagine? They're making a big investment into gaming. They own now six in-house game studios. They've done most of that through acquisition. I think the near-term opportunity in gaming is really mobile gaming. And what they want to do is just earn more consumer time on mobile, more time outside of the house. And then gaming, I think, will be strategic in markets like Southeast Asia, where mobile gaming is just a huge use case. So the near term for gaming is to make the subscription just stickier, create engagement and to create more uses outside the home. Long term, I think there's a really interesting opportunity to marry their own IP and long form storytelling with gaming to create these synergistic kind of unique entertainment experiences. So if you think about being able to explore a story through the game, I mean, you can sort of go through it. Squid Game, you could be a character or Ozark, you come in and you want to defend the Snell's farm, or there's a way to have the experience to be able to access new parts of the storytelling or 
have a different experience through a game that comes out at the same time the movie or show comes out. And I think that that's the long-term vision. And that would be, if they could do it, it's not really a new category of entertainment, but boy, there would be really great opportunity there to just make the subscription more valuable to really wow people with that. Let's flip it around. So let's say it's five or 10 years in the future and it's not done well at all and then sort mm-hmm. of missed this chance or this opportunity. What's gone wrong in that case? What are the big risks here? It's possible that the streaming market is closer to maturity than I projected earlier. So I don't think that's likely. As we said, most television time is still broadcast and cable. But if the streaming market was smaller in terms of users or consumer time than as projected, that probably takes a little bit of the upside out. If consumer behavior evolves in a way where people are churning on and off services, they're signing up to watch a show, and then they go to another service as a show they want to watch, and there isn't the ability to maintain customer lifetime value or keep customers loyal. That's a net negative for the economics. The third one, I mean, I can tell you why I don't think this is true, but one of the overhangs of the streaming business is that all the companies are just kind of on a content treadmill. They have to reinvest consistently in content. Content's hit driven. It's unpredictable. So you have to keep reinvesting more in new content to keep customers subscribed to your service. And it's this unfavorable dynamic of more spending on content to keep the same base of people subscribed. And if that ends up to be how the market evolves, which I don't think it will, that would be a negative for the business. You know, we ask the same three questions to end every episode. Lessons for builders. So if you're an entrepreneur executive, maybe what's the one lesson from this story? Lesson for investors, you know, what's the one big lesson? And then if people want to learn more about Netflix, where would you guide them to? So let's just take those one at a time. So what's the big lesson for builders out there? The lesson to me is you work backwards from your customers' needs. And that's not a novel lesson or that's not necessarily a new takeaway, but I think Netflix has really practiced that philosophy and that's been key to the success. So the company went public in 2002 and they raised $82.5 million and $300 million market value. And the market cap today is about $120 billion. So you do not 400x the value of your company unless you put your customer at the center of everything you do. So they've done that and they haven't let any competing concerns or business interests knock them off that path. And then the other lesson is you just want to have the best people. You bet on people over time. And I think Netflix, by creating a place, really the vanguard of entertainment and technology, the really talented people want to work, it has been key to the long-term success of the business. So establishing a environment and a culture that really attracts the best in your industry and then making sure you can keep them. What's the lesson for investors in the Netflix story? Patience, I think, has been a good one. There's been several periods. I think we're maybe in the fourth 60% drawdown in the history of the company. And it's never been a good time really to sell Netflix stock. And there's always been reasons to be worried or concerned. But if you have been patient and you've been able to keep your eye on this really big long-term opportunity, I think you've been rewarded, but it's definitely required a level of patience that I think is hard. The other one is for me is to make sure you're investing against things that can improve. So every component of the Netflix business, both on a macro level, just in terms of access, quality, speed of the internet, that's improved. The smart device ecosystem has improved. Smart TVs have become cheaper, more accessible and better. The picture quality has gotten better. Everything has improved. And then within the subscription, you think about it started as second run movies and TV shows. And now they have the broadest catalog of original entertainment in the world. That's improved. So focusing on where things can go and what the drivers of improvement in the business are, you've been rewarded as an investor by keeping your eye on that as opposed to how things look today. On the 60% drawdown, Netflix seems distinct in the regard of it gets massive euphoria and massive fear. Do you think there's something about the business or the story that lends that that way? I do. I think for a long time, the lack of free cash flow has worried people. So it's hard to value any business when you can't value it as a multiple of current profits or current free cash flow. So that's been a concern. And that's particularly a concern, I think, during periods of market volatility. Hopefully, we're rounding the bend on that. As I said earlier, we're going to start to see an extremely cash generative business. They're actually much better positioned, by the way, than most of their peers in terms of growing free cash flow from streaming where peers are losing money. So that's been one really big overhang. And then another is just competition. You have some of the biggest, best companies in the world in your market, Disney, Amazon, Apple, 
So at any point in time, there's been a reason to think Netflix is not going to be able to compete, invest at the scale that those companies have been able to invest with those businesses. But you know that's not been true. To some degree, I think there's still concerns that exist today. I think with like an Amazon or a Google, it's pretty established that those are the market leaders in their industry. And it's just not really worries, maybe on the margin, but not really worries about competition. But Netflix, those worries still exist, which in my mind, create a big opportunity long-term in the stock because if it proves to be the case that Netflix has sustainable competitive advantage and is able to grow its free cash flow in the way I think it's going to, then the stock over time can become much more valuable. Awesome. And where would you tell people to go for further study? I think Reed Hastings wrote a book called No Rules Rules, which is really good. And then the Netflix shareholder letters have been really a great source of information, insight into the business from the management team. They're very well written. They pay equal amounts of attention to the financial performance of the business, as well as content. Awesome. Well, Ben, this was an amazing masterclass on Netflix. And uh, thank you for coming on Business Breakdowns. Thank you for having me. It was great. To find more episodes of Breakdowns ranging from Costco to Visa to Moderna, or to sign up for our weekly summary, check out joincolossus.com. That's J-O-I-N-C-O-L-O-S-S-U-S dot com. 